Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Credit Chat. I'm Rod Griffin, Director of Consumer Education and Advocacy for Experian. I'm here to answer your questions about credit reporting and credit scoring and fraud and ID theft, and all of those things that are important to us, especially now. And I know there's only one thing that everybody wants to talk about, huge news, and that's Tom Brady leaving the New England Patriots and how important that's going to be to them. But I'm joking. Bad joke on a rough time, but I'm trying to stay, at least be a little light. You know, and everybody take a deep breath uh, because we know we're all dealing with coronavirus. We all here uh, at Experian are as well. Um, we are all uh, under direction to work from home, including our CEO, if we at all possible. So I know that's important, everybody. I know if you have questions, feel free to ask. I'll do my best to answer. We talk about what's happening in the credit marketplace, things that our industry is doing uh, to, to help and what we've done through natural disasters, things are available uh, so uh, to help and, and what it might mean over time, but also kind of the same things we need to talk about. How do you protect your credit history? What do you need to do to make sure that it's there to work for you? Uh, you know, so feel free to ask. It's about having a conversation and that dialogue. So please do feel free to ask, don't be shy. Uh, Shackman47, thanks for joining. Ms. ZD4, great to see you as always. Uh, Shoney628, thanks for being here and being part of the chat. Again, if you have questions, please feel free to ask. I'll do my very best to answer. Uh, little buddy, what's the name of that guy giving me credit or taking it away from me? <laughs> um, not sure which guy we're talking about. Um, so it would be your lender would make those decisions uh, and decide whether or not you're approved or declined. Uh, your credit history is something Experian maintains. Uh, and it's really reflected by how you use the credit you have available to you. Uh, and so if you're using your credit well, making payments on time, you know, paying your balances down, keeping them low, you're going to have good credit. It's going to show that you're good credit risk, really that simple. Um, but, you know, it's, it's our credit histories are used to help make those lending decisions. So we play a, a obviously crucial part in that. Uh, and so I want to make sure that you know what you need to know about your credit history so that it's a tool that's there to work through you, through you, work for you, uh, and through the lender to help you get the credit you need when you need it. You know, credit history shouldn't be a mystery. Your credit score shouldn't be a mystery. And especially at a time like this, knowing where you stand, how to use them, how to make sure that they're, they're protected and there to work for you can be critically important. And that's why I want to make sure we're here and talking, answering the questions you have uh, and about what you can do to help make sure that it's that that credit history is there for you and, and working for you. Uh, babe Girl, thanks for joining. Uh, Ms. E4, as the stocks fall, will it affect your lenders? Will they lend at a higher percentage rate? Um, you know, I'm not an investment guy. Generally, um, stock market isn't related to lending and interest rates. Instead, uh, the, the Federal Reserve Bank announced that they are temporarily lowering their interest rate to 0%. What that means is the Federal Reserve will lend money to the banks at 0%. Usually, that means that you can get loans at a lower interest rate from your lenders because it costs them less to borrow money from the Federal Reserve Bank. Uh, but that's usually, like a lot of things with credit, that doesn't happen right away. Uh, that was just announced last week, so you'll probably begin to see that. I think we've seen some things in the mortgage market where the rates have dropped a little bit. Um, Will your credit cards uh, lim be a limit on what you can buy? Uh, so, um, with the you know the two are really disconnected, not connected directly. Uh, so, um, if you you know are using your credit well and, and maintaining it, your credit cards are still there. They're still available to use. That hasn't changed uh, and won't change as a result of the stock market. What changes as a result of the stock market is my when I get to retire, which is now looking much further away for the moment. However, <laughs> if you're continuing to invest, um, you know, Warren Buffett would say, buy low, this is, might be a good time to buy. I'm not an investment guy. Uh, so uh, you can talk to him about that. But I'm a credit guy. So um, my strategy with investing is to close my eyes, cross my fingers, keep staying in for the long term and talking to my, you know, my financial advisor and trying to stay calm, which I think is what all, all of us are trying to do right now. Um, is just stay calm. You know, don't, you know, it, it, and that's what's hard. Everybody's affected. My family's affected. You know, we're looking at, uh, you know, the jobs and, and closings. So I have a daughter that works for a school district. They're all closed, so she doesn't have that source of income. I have another daughter who works part-time in the service industry. She's not going to be able to work, so she's going to lose some income. 
you know, so it affects all of us. And I think that's what's, you know, really important right now when we think about what we're doing in response to the coronavirus. And, um, you know, we're all trying to work together and trying to do the right things, but at the same time, stay calm and, and follow the instructions that are given to us, um, you know, by the government, by our employers. You know, I can tell you I'm, uh, that with Experian, I'm very proud of our company and our leadership. Uh, our CEO has said, we want you to work from home. We want you to be safe. And he's doing the same thing. So, um, you know, he's a great example of leading by example. So uh, really important uh, that, you know, you, you do what's advised. I think that's the first thing that's going to be important. But then what are the economic implications? And we're all thinking about that and how we help people through that, that this time because it's so new and so unknown. So um, kind of the same thing, Christina. I'm, I'm not looking either. I did the other day and was happy to see it hadn't fallen as much as I thought, and I haven't looked for at least a week, um, and definitely not going to do right now. Um, you know, so my retirement's quite a ways away, so I'm not too not panicked about it. For other people, big deal. But this is about credit reports and credit scores and, and fraud ID theft, all of those things. So um, not an investment discussion. I'm the wrong guy to ask about that. So Paj5, thanks for joining, being part of the credit chat. If you're just jumping in, I'm Rod Griffin. I'm Director of Consumer Education and Advocacy for Experian. This is Credit Chat. I'll be here for at least 30 minutes to try to answer your questions about credit reporting and credit scoring and fraud and ID theft. I know that the, that you know there's a lot of concern and rightfully so about what happens in the lending marketplace and what's going to happen with your credit history. Uh, and you know I can tell you it's not business as usual for any of us in any field right now. Um, you know so we have plans in the industry that we're implementing. Uh, through our Consumer Data Industry Association, which is our industry provider that allows and enables, not just allows, but enables us to work with lenders and for them to report accounts in forbearance or deferment uh, to add a, a statement to your accounts that says you're affected by a, a national health emergency So, uh, and can help protect your credit history and your credit score. So we're doing a number of things to work with lenders and work with consumers to make sure that you are protected through this time as much as we possibly can. Uh, and it, you, know, you can enroll in um, a free fraud monitoring service, so things like that. So um, lots of things out there that are being put in place and that are happening because we want to make sure that we help people and communicate effectively with people about what we do. So um, really important. I'm under $8,000 in debt. Um, uh, yo, who did it? Excellent. Uh, when was the first credit report sent to a customer? Uh, so from school, uh, you had did it from school, but it may grow. And it will. I mean, it may be, uh, but you're doing well. Uh, and so $8,000 for a, a college degree, um, borrow as little as you can. That's the, the best advice I can give. Uh, and you know what we know and what all of the data shows is that if you graduate and get that bachelor's degree, for the mass, vast majority of people, having a bachelor's degree results in or will result in over the course of your career uh, greater earnings potential of more than a million dollars as compared to a person with a high school diploma. So if you only have eight or ten or fifteen thousand dollars in student loan debt, but it leads to much greater earnings potential, I think that's a good investment. You just don't want to have too much student loan debt. So that's the trick, uh, and, and always is. Um, you know, I have a granddaughter. I've told this story that she was going to go to college uh, and found out what, and, and had some things in the family happen and couldn't go to the school she wanted to initially. She had to make a really hard decision, uh, you know, her dream school, and it was going to cost almost $50,000 a year, if I remember right. So she went to junior college instead, and tuition went from $25,000 a semester to less than $700 a semester. She's completing her two years there. Turns out that they offer through a partnership essentially the same degree, four-year degree through that same school, uh, but through a, through a four-year university in Texas Tech, I think, is offering it. So she's probably going to finish there. Uh, and now that little my little ladybug got a full-time job, uh, and the job pays tuition reimbursement. So she's uh, finding ways to pay for school um, without taking on debt. So she's a smart little cookie. Uh, I'm very proud of her. Uh, but so there are things to do. And sometimes it means taking on debt. I did the student loan route. <laughs> so I've been there and done that. Um, when was the first, so little buddy, when was the first credit report sent to a customer? So if we're talking about customer, like a lender or a business credit reporting, 
Uh, and depending on which of uh, the credit reporting companies you talk to, we all have a different perspective on who was first. Um, but Experian will tell you that credit reporting began in Dallas, Texas with a gentleman named Jim Chilton in the late 1800s, early 1900s. And he would go from business to business, so merchant to merchant, store to store, and take notes in a little book about how their credit um, customers paid their bills. Uh, and compile those into files. And then when they would then ask him how, the, if, if that person, if they went and applied for credit somewhere else and said they wanted a credit agreement, and he would tell them you know, whether or not, what his notes said from the other lender. Now, back in those days, kind of wild, wild west, um, those notes could say things like, um, well, he's really good payer and really reliable. It could say that he's not very reliable, but his dad is, so he's good for the payments, or he drinks too much, so you probably shouldn't make a loan to him. Uh, we do not do those things anymore today. Uh, so over the la next 100 years or more, actually 120, 130 years, the credit reporting industry has evolved, and today we get information about how you pay your bills on, uh, with your lenders, specifically all debt-related, all factual, uh, and so it's the bills paid on time or it's late. Uh, and you pay off your debts or you don't, and it shows in that credit report, you can get all of that information directly from experience, see everything we have on your file. So, uh, but credit reporting itself dates back more than 100 years. So uh, really kind of fascinating history and the way it evolved and what it's become because now it's very uh, scientific, very data-driven, uh, highly predictive of how a person will manage their debts. Uh, and then credit scores evolved in the late uh, 70s uh, or 1970s, early 80s, really be began to, to appear. Um, credit reporting itself was computerized in the late 1960s. Uh, so kind of interesting history. Um, but first credit reports actually came out, and they were verbal. Uh, so you would call and ask. Uh, and by telephone in the, like the 30s, 40s, 50s, you know, when we started using telephones, and they would call, and there would be a person on the phone that would read the report. Uh, we don't do that anymore either. So um, kind of interesting the way it evolved. Uh, did your master's in law? Um, we all have our theories on lawyers. <laughs> five, 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 Mr. Perfect. I have great friends who are lawyers, so, and really important. Um, Hot Spice 3, thanks for joining. Uh, you who did it, thanks for joining. Angela, 4124-7596, thanks for joining. Um, when are y'all making updates? So, Angela, uh, the so we we are currently, and you know, we're always updating the credit reports and credit histories. Uh, you can find more about what we are doing at Experian if you're thinking about coronavirus. Uh, and if you go to Experian.com, there's a note, that, and we'll be updating that and information periodically. Uh, our industry already has in place and has activated you know, our crisis tools for lenders. So they're able, if you talk to your lender, they may be able to, to work with you in a number of different ways, including how they report information to us. Uh, so talk to them. Uh, and it, it, we tend to be, at, in credit reporting, sort of a, a lagging indicator or follower. So as things evolve, you know, it takes 30 days in most cases, sometimes as much as 45 for your payment history to be updated. It might be sooner, depending on when the billing cycle ends that you're in. But usually it's like a month um, before you see updates. So for us, with the changes that are happening and the things that are happening today in terms of our, our workplace and what's happening with the coronavirus, probably won't see significant impact uh, on your credit history until next month, uh, you know, so after 30 or 45 days, depending on when things happen in the cycle. So there's some time there. You know, so uh, keep that in mind. You know, if, if you're going to have difficulty and you know you might have difficulty making payments, if your job is now being shut down, as so many of them are, through no reason of your own. It's because of that little bug that's going around. Um, you know, talk to your lenders. Talk to them early. Ask them what your options are. How can they work with you? You know, I saw some news stories today about lenders doing things to uh, work with, with their customers to make sure that they're not affected uh, because of, you know, the, the, it's not really job loss, but um, lack of work while we go through this, I guess, is a way to describe it. Um, and so that's going to take a bit of time. Uh, so 
monitor your credit report. Get it. You can get a free copy of your report once every 12 months. You can enroll in free monitoring service with Experian if you'd like to do that. Uh, and that way, if there's any change or any anything happens with your credit history, we'll notify you of that. Uh, you know, so that's a, a good starting point. But talk to your lenders first. Talk to them early and often. Ask what their options are because they're going to be on the front line. Uh, and then as we move forward, as time passes, we'll begin to play a bigger role, I think, in, in that process. Uh, as it's, it comes time to report your payment history, the next billing cycle. Uh, so you'll want to make sure that you're monitoring your reports, know what's there, uh, work with your lenders, make sure that they're reporting information accurately. Um, as I said, you know, we know that we have a system that lets them re report information or, or accounts in deferment or in forbearance. And they know, you know what those are, and it's a matter of time, and they can look at their customers' uh, situations and, and help in that regard. So um, talk to your lenders, first and foremost, uh, and then be educated, be up to date, uh, keep track of you know what's going on. Um, Penny Monique, let me go back, see if I can find your question. Um, where did I miss it? Penny Monique, if you make a purchase with a credit card and pay it off within three days, will it be charged interest? No. Uh, so, and that's what's important. If you use a credit card to make a purchase, the, you, you typically have a you know, billing cycle of 30 days and what you will be charged interest on is any payment, you, any amount that you revolve from one month to the next. So if you make a charge and you pay that balance in full when you get the billing statement, or as you're, you're suggesting, if you pay it in full right away, you wouldn't be charged interest on that amount. If you made a, a, a charge and 30 days later you got the bill and you only paid half of it, you would be charged interest on the part that you didn't pay, over, that you've revolved, which is a fancy word for carried over balance, so it's a revolving account as a credit card, uh, so that you revolve or carry over to the next month. So you get paid interest on any remaining balance. So if you pay in full, you're not gonna pay interest. And that's a great way to use credit. And you know, if you're making small purchases, paying them full, uh, and getting cash back or discounts on your purchases and those sorts of things. It actually works to your advantage. So use credit as a financial tool. And I say this every time we talk, use credit as a financial tool, debt's the financial problem. So um, no, you wouldn't uh, be charged interest. Not even looking for 1K. Yeah, we talked about that. Um, talked about credit report, talked about school, got a master's in law. Um, so if, when we make updates, so we're continuing business as usual at Experian. So you, know, you would still see things being updated. Quick question, your brother filed for bankruptcy twice. Is there a limit? Ms. ZD4, um, that's a good question for a bankruptcy attorney who sells somebody with a master's in law, they might be able to tell you. Uh, but I know that there are restrictions on how long you have to wait between bankruptcies uh, uh, and before you can declare again. So, you know, you may be able to declare multiple times, but you probably will have to wait a certain period of time before you can the next time. Uh, and so, and that's part of the reason you know, that they have that time frame is what they call recidivism. And there's a fairly large uh, recidivism rate, a repeat rate in bankruptcy. Uh, and so, you know, that it, it's, there is a, a limit in terms of how soon you can apply. I don't know if there's a limit in terms of the number of times that you can apply. Good question for a bankruptcy attorney or a court or a state attorney general, somebody like that. Um, how does CBR look at a settlement on a charge off account? If you settle, will it increase your score? Uh, so Grat, uh, and I'll get this wrong. Uh, grateful Gwen, I actually got it right. Figured it out. Uh, I'm terrible at the license plate thing too. So <laughs> grateful for the grateful Gwen. Thanks. Uh, great question. Uh, and when you see a settlement reported in your credit report, so an account that you've negotiated payment for less than originally agreed, that account will be reported as settled and that status is considered negative. It will have a negative effect on your credit scores. Now, it depends on how, in terms of how much negative, depends on your, your credit history overall. And that's kind of the answer to every credit reporting question. It depends. Uh, so it depends on you know, what does the rest of your credit history look like? Do you have other accounts and they're all in good shape, or do you have a, it has do you have a lot of late payments? Do you have collection accounts? You know, so in terms of an effect on scores, that number will depend, and the the effect on that number will depend on all of the other information in your report. But it will be negative. It will hurt your scores when you settle a debt. Uh, so when lenders get your report, they're going to see that settlement. They're going to have that report scored, and it will 
have a negative effect. Uh, that said, you know, when people ask about debt settlement, it doesn't mean it's the wrong thing to do, it, but it's meant as one of those last resort things when you cannot manage the debt and have no other options. Uh, and so, you know, I always advise people talk to a good credit counseling service. They can help you identify perhaps ways to manage the debt, uh, to repay it without having to settle. And if necessary, they can work with you to negotiate with your lenders to settle uh, the debt. Uh, but look at all the options. So nfcc.org, we, we uh, mention them all the time as well. Uh, and so great nonprofit organizations around the country. Uh, and there are, other, there are other good ones as well. So, but that's a, that's a good place to start. Uh, my student loans were reported late in error and lowered my score. Could experience fix that. So you did it. Uh, it, what you should do is dispute those accounts. If, so if they were reported incorrectly, go to experience.com slash dispute and you'll be able to get a free copy of your report if you don't already have one. It sounds like you might. Uh, so if they reported them late, if you have a current copy of your credit report that you've gotten within the last 60 days, uh, you'll be able to enter the report number and we'll show you that report right there online. It's a secured encrypted system. And with each account, there's a button that says, I need to dispute this. And you click that dispute button and then follow the instructions. And you, it's really simple to do. Uh, so you would go to those student loan accounts and hit dispute. You know, it was never late. Uh, it would probably be the dispute, I'm guessing, without knowing more. And then we go back to the source of those uh, accounts, so the student lending organizations, and would say, you're telling us that these are reported incorrectly. They need You need to review your records. The lender is then required by law to review their records and then notify us either that it's updated in some way, so either you know the, the, the late payment would be removed, uh, or they could say, we need to, re to update it in some other way, or... Uh, that it remains as reported. So, and then we would notify you of those results. If you disagree, we strongly encourage you to add what we call a statement of dispute. And you can go online and upload documentation, add a statement of dispute that says, I disagree and here's why. And it lets you tell that story, tell your side of the story, explain why you believe it's incorrect. And that way, anytime a business or lender gets your report, they'll be notified of that statement. They'll be able to take that into account and you can talk to them, demonstrate them. And so we we tell the whole story. Uh, so that's what uh, I recommend you do. Dispute that information. There's no cost to do that. It's free. It will not affect your credit scores in any way. Don't have to worry about anything like that. Uh, so if you believe information is correct, you should always dispute it. Um, Bishop 0531, thanks for joining. I'm catching up. Uh, I have no credit. What should I do? So Brother Dank, uh, can be a challenge. It's one of those classic catch-22 things. Uh, so if you do not have credit yet, you won't have a credit history. So uh, there are several things that you might be able to do. One, if you rent, so if you have an apartment, talk to your, your apartment manager or your, or your landlord and ask them if they will report your positive rent payments to your credit history. And you can search Experian Rent Reporting and find out how to do that. The, and they can work with uh, several uh, other third-party companies to report your positive rent payments each month that gets added to your credit report can help you start to build that credit report. So you would establish their credit history and begin to build it. So one good way using something other than a traditional credit account. Uh, and then the other options, having someone add you as an authorized user on one of their accounts, having someone co-sign for you, maybe going to a credit union or a bank and getting a small loan, a personal loan for just a few hundred dollars even doesn't have to be very much and then pay that off. And that will start that credit history. Once you've started that history, you can go use Experian Boost. So if you go to experian.com slash boost, you can have your positive cell phone payments, utility payments reported that can help increase your score. And, and, and we talk about it all the time, but I've seen you know, scores increase. On average, what we're seeing is about 13 points, uh, but we're seeing people within files or just beginning their credit history, like your situation, on average, are seeing a 19-point increase when they boost. So once it's established and you add that boost, uh, service and it's free and it's uh, your choice. So once you give us permission to capture those payments and we access your bank account once a month, catch, capture the utility payments, so water, electricity, gas, uh, or your cell phone payments, your cable TV bills, add those as accounts on your credit report. If you change your mind, you can tell us to stop. We'll stop doing it. So you have complete control over that. Uh, and so two options, and then, you know, have someone as you a joint account holder, someone uh, be a co-signer, kind of the options that are available. So, and, but once you're started, then it's a matter of just being consistent. 
make those payments on time every single time. Keep your balances low. Get a you know a secured account is a good way to, to get started. So you put some savings in an account and you get a credit card tied to that savings account. Make a small purchase every month. It can be you know 10 or $20. Turn around and pay it right away so you're not paying interest. You're not taking on debt, but you're building that history. And then it's just time. And so time comes from that. Um, if you're going to pay off, uh, pay half, Look at your billing cycle and make purchases according. Play the game. Yeah, I mean, Jay Romeo, you know, if you're and if you're going to pay half, understand what your billing cycle. You know, if you're and I always say using credit, whether it's a credit card or a loan, you need to know before you do that one how you're going to pay it off, two when you're going to pay off. So you need a specific date or time frame, and then. Think about what you're going to have to either delay purchasing or not purchase at all until that's paid off. Uh, so, you know, the, taking on a debt to make a purchase is a financial decision that requires compromises and thoughtfulness. Uh, because if you're just making charges and not thinking about it, you'll suddenly find yourself in too much debt and then in, get start sliding into deeper trouble and not be able to manage it or recover. So you need to be thoughtful about how you use credit and why you use it uh, and kind of goes to that playing the game. Well, how am I using credit? Why am I using it the way I'm using it? How am I going to pay it back? When am I going to pay it back? And what do I have to give up? Because it's always a trade-off. Um, what's the... Let me see if I missed here. Uh, John Sack, thanks for joining. Um, what is the easiest, safest way to improve your credit? Uh, 75 Cisco. Great question. Uh, so I just talked about Experian Boost. If you have credit in place, having those positive cell phone utility payments... That's, that service is just a year old now, uh, really important uh, and proving very powerful for a lot of people, very great feedback. We would love to hear from you if you've used Experian Boost and it's enabled you to make a purchase that you otherwise couldn't or to achieve a financial goal. We'd love to know more about what those are. So let us know uh, and we'd love to share those stories. Uh, but Experian Boost is a good way, um, a secured account. But beyond that, the easiest and safest way you know, the things that always apply are if you have credit card balances that are high, start to pay them down. It's not very exciting. It's not instant. There, there really is no instant fix. So if somebody comes to you and says, if you do this, you'll have great scores tomorrow, they don't know what they're talking about. Uh, so there's no overnight fix. It's going to be time. You know, time is the most important factor. And the length of time will depend on what these specific issues are. So if you, know, if you have one late payment, everything else is fine. You catch up on that late payment. Within a month or two, your scores probably bounce back up. If you have, you know, a bankruptcy, a foreclosure, things like that that are really serious negative issues that indicate high risk and you're recovering, it's going to take longer. Uh, and so you could see months, in some cases years. Um, but that's the fact, and I'm not going to sugarcoat that. It you know just depends on your situation. Um, but if you pay down your balances on your credit cards, that usually has... The biggest effect, the fastest, catch up on any late payments, those two things will always be the most important and the fastest. So you want low utilization, balances on your credit cards to be as low as possible. That's going to help the most uh, and the fastest. And then catching up on any late payments, bringing them current. Uh, if you have collection accounts, if you can pay off the collection, the newest scoring systems will exclude them from the calculation so they won't affect scores anymore so you could see an immediate improvement if you pay off a collection it's report as soon as it's reported paid to Experian the next time a score is calculated it will ignore that paid collection if it's a Vantage score 3.0 or 4.0 or, or a FICO uh, 8 9 or 10 now I haven't seen 10 in place yet they've just announced that FICO 8 is the most common score used so you could see immediate improvement that way so those are some things you can do um is it good? Uh, is it a good idea to refinance your house to pay off credit card debt? Um, so here's the the issue. Um, you know, consider if you're refinancing your home uh, and you're paying off your credit card debt. What are the terms of that loan? Uh, if you are getting a HELOC, for example, a home equity line of credit or home equity loan that then pays off that credit card. But it says, if you don't repay off this debt, we can take your house, um, which it can be the case. The question becomes, is it worth risking your home to pay off a credit card debt? Um, you know, so always consider when you refinance, if you're refinancing a home to invest back in the home or you're refinancing a home because it lowers your payments and helps you manage your other debts well, 
Absolutely. I think that's always a good choice. But if you're refinancing a home in a way that is being used to make other purchases uh, or to pay off other debts, but that under the contract, use your house as security, meaning if you don't fulfill the terms of the loan, they could potentially repossess your house or take your home from you. You need to give that more thought. I would be very careful about that. Uh, so you know, we see people now who will uh, take a home equity loan to buy an expensive car. You know, and I've seen it over and over. And you hear people, and it's like, why do you want to put your house at risk to drive a fancy car? Um, you know, you need that place to live. So think about it in those terms. Uh, it might be the right thing to do, depending on the terms of the loan and, and what you're trying to do uh, and what your debts are. You know, maybe not. It just You just have to be sure that, uh, you know, make sure that you're making the decision with full understanding of what the terms of the loan are. You know, I think that's the most important thing. Uh, the apartment folks wants you to pay them to do so. Um, so usually, you know, see how much. I mean, if it's a nominal fee and they add it to your rent, it's worthwhile to you. It might be worth doing. I've talked to landlords who will do it and heard from people who've said their landlords will report their rent as a benefit to them because they're a good renter and they want to keep them. Uh, others may charge a portion of the cost and, and then cover part of the cost. So it really does depend on your landlord uh, in terms of, of what they're doing there. So, um, you know, th that's their decision. Uh, you know, they don't have to report. But you know, if you've asked, yeah, I, you know, I appreciate that because we would like them to report. We think it's really beneficial to people and we know that it's helpful to people and helps you become a better credit risk, helps you manage your, your finances better. So which makes you a better renter um, because you're able to pay that rent on time better because you have less financial stress when you have a good credit history and you're able to get, you know, loans or access to financial services at lower cost, all of those things. So um, my personal opinion, not necessarily those of Experian. Uh, so, you know, I always add that in. Um, this is... If, for how much credit card debt you have. So, yeah, so it's all, yeah, and credit card debt's important. Uh, can Sugar81, can credit card companies reduce your credit limit even though you're never late? Potentially, yes. Yeah, so um, Jay Romeo's answering my questions before I do. That's not fair. Uh, so, but yes, they can. Um, and it depends on their terms. And, you know, if you have, for example, in the, and it will say in the contract, if your contract uh, says if you reach a certain threshold of, debt as compared to a balance as compared to limit, they could change your uh, credit limit potentially. If you fall behind on other accounts, there are some credit card agreements. I haven't seen as many recently, but in the past, if you had a credit card, you became late on a payment. Uh, and as part of their account review, that credit card company you're talking about saw that late payment, they could reduce your credit limit or increase your interest rates. Make sure you understand the terms of the contract. That's really important. You know, what is it they, they, that they're doing? Um, I have 800 score, 60,000 savings. What's the largest home loan I can get? Um, that's a question for a mortgage lender. You know, we at a credit reporting companies, but it's a great question to ask because it's important to understand. Credit reporting companies like Experian do not make lending decisions. We don't approve or decline applications. We don't determine how much you qualify for. That's what lenders do. So lenders decide based on all of the information you provide in an application as well as your credit history how much you would qualify for when you apply for a home loan or an auto loan or a credit card, any kind of, or personal loan, any kind of loan that they may be giving. So your credit report's part of that process, but it's not the whole thing. Uh, so you know, lenders are going to look at your ability to repay. So what are your assets and your income? They're going to look at your credit history to see how you've managed previous debts. That That's really important. Uh, they're going to look at your relationships with them in the past, potentially, uh, outside of what uh, you might see in a credit history uh, that they may have records of that we don't. Uh, so, so if example, you've worked with a bank for 20 or 30 years, we may not have accounts that show that history, but they would see them in their records. So, um, you know, they're, they're going to look at lots of information. Credit reports is part of that. Lenders then use that information to help them make the lending decision and determine how much you'll qualify for. So question for a mortgage lender. Good idea to get pre-qualified. Uh, or pre-approved when you start thinking about a, a mortgage loan because then you'll know where to start looking and what you need to do. If you're planning to apply, one of the things that I do always recommend is get your credit report at least three, if not six months in advance so that 
If there's anything that you need to address, you can make sure it's in great shape before you go apply so that you can qualify for what you need. The other th thing about your question is you probably should never ask, what's the most I can qualify for? The question you should ask is, what's the most I can truly afford? Now, just because the bank will give you that much money doesn't necessarily mean you should take all of it because you have to consider when you go to buy a house, you're going to have to pay not only the mortgage, but the taxes that go along with it. So it's uh, your property tax, uh, you know, things like your school district tax. There are lots of things add into that that you're going to have to account for. And owning a home is expensive. Uh, so how are you going to furnish it? How are you going to maintain it? Because you have a water heater that will probably break at some point. You may have, if you're like, I am in Texas, we have hailstorms and about every five years I have to replace my roof um, because we get hailstorms that damage it and you need to replace the shingles. Uh, you have to paint it. You have to make sure that, uh, you know, the, the main, that it's maintained. So your lawn is maintained. You have to pay homeowners association dues potentially, which can be really expensive or maybe not pay on your homeowner association if you have one. You know, so there are lots of expenses associated with owning a home that you need to prepare for and save for too. So be careful about how you define afford. You know, because a lender and a realtor are going to tell you you can afford the most that they can possibly get you to pay. Um, you need to define how much you can afford based on what you have with reserve. So what's your emergency savings and how much are you able to set aside for maintenance and repairs and um, keeping the house in good shape. So keep those things in mind as well. Um, so and makes any case. So it's really a question for the lender uh, in that case, but I always would look at that. Um, and being self-employed, that's another interesting kind of factor. So they're looking at um, you know what? How do you establish income and stability when you're self-employed? That can be a challenge. It can also be a benefit. So you talk to your lenders. Um, you can get approved for 300 plus. Depends on your debt ratio. Um, again, getting what you can get approved for, and this is where I'll take, I'll, I'll disagree with Jay Romeo as to whether or not it's a good plan, um, because when you're looking at all of your debts in total, just because you get approved for that doesn't mean you should take it and it'll get excited about it, um, because you'll find yourself house poor, that's what we think of. You'll have a house, but to make those payments, you're going to have to sit in that house on a folding chair with no TV and no cable because you can't afford it otherwise. So don't take as much as you can get, but be sure you understand how, how much you can truly afford. And afford means you have to have reserve. So, and plan for expenses and those sorts of things. I'm just always cautious because um, you, you'll hear lots of things about how much you can afford from people who want to sell you their house. Um, you need to make that decision for yourself and be careful about it. I own a home, I'm paying off a home, and I'm would not and wouldn't trade it for, you know, for the world. I love it, but it, I can tell you from experience, it's really expensive, um, and so and it's a lot of work maintaining a house. So, um, you know, I, I sometimes say, and, I, and we have a. Uh, I was talking to one of our mortgage executives, and the other day, and we kind of had the same conversation that maybe a house isn't the right. We don't think a house is the right thing for everybody. There shouldn't be any shame in renting. You know, I've told people if I had st continued to rent an apartment and put all of the money that I had have had to put into my home to maintain it into investments, I probably could have retired by now. So, you know, think about those things too uh, and be sure you're ready. How much down payment are you going to need? Uh, you know, all of those sorts of things are going to be important. Do you want to pay points? Points, just interest, uh, additional interest so you can have a, a you know, lower interest rate potentially. So all those things are, are part of it. Um and houses in Southern California are incredibly expensive. <laughs> so, um, it, absolutely true. And you cover up chapter 13, all of our debts are paid back. Just have our home and the second mortgage. So, um, uh, Tara Jean, one, two, three. Uh, patience is kind of part of it. If you have an account that's open and active, say a small credit card, a credit card with a small balance, or pardon me, a small limit, even just like a $500, $750 limit, make a $10 or $20 purchase every month every couple of months, pay it in full right away so you're not, carrying it, not paying interest or carrying a balance, that's going to start to establish that positive payment history. That will help you begin to sort of backfill your credit report and rehabilitate that credit history with positive information. So 
think about doing that. That's one good way. And then again, if you have a history, Experian Boost can help you in that regard, potentially. Um, and, and, you know, make use of those tools that are available to you. Um, I, uh, I, uh, I, I, Mohammed, I'm probably probably said it wrong. I apologize if you did. Welcome, thanks for joining. Uh, instead of refinancing, try balance transfer. Uh, thought it was coronavirus. <laughs> so I thought we would talk a lot about coronavirus, but we're not. So it's, I mean, and it, because it's still the same issue, you still need to continue doing the same things. You need to keep making those payments on time. You need to continue to, you know, be thoughtful about how you can pay down your debts. How do you manage those debts? But also take, you know, talk to your lenders. So we said early. So um, thanks for joining, being part of the chat. I mean, we talked a lot, the half hour, and then some went really fast. So if you're just joining, I'm Rod Griffin. I'm Director of Consumer Education and Advocacy for Experian. This is Credit Chat. I try to be here 130 Central, 230 Eastern to answer your questions about credit reporting and credit scoring and fraud and e-theft, all of those sorts of things that are important to you and your financial health and helping answer the questions you have so you can act on them and, and use that report to your advantage. So um, thanks for being here and being part of the chat. Join us tomorrow, 130 Central. Uh, pardon me, let me try that again. Join us tomorrow on Twitter, 2 o'clock Central, 3 o'clock Eastern for Credit Chat. Uh, and I'll be here Thursday, 1.30 Central, 2.30 Eastern to answer questions again. Uh, oh, by the way, Green, happy uh, St. Patrick's Day, uh, even though all of everything's canceled <laughs> and closed. Um, but have a great day and hope to see you tomorrow. You can learn more at ex.pn slash credit chat. So check, check out our website, ex.pn slash credit chat. Thank you all for being here. Take care, everybody. I know it's a really strange time in our world, and I want everybody to be safe uh, and hope we can help as we all work through this together. So take care, everybody. I'll talk to you all very soon.